All right, well, hello, uh, welcome to Java User Group, um, our January meeting, first of 2013, I think the beginning of year five, Yeah. which is very exciting. Um, so we've got a new year and I've got a couple housekeeping items. Uh, we've changed our meeting time. We used to meet on the third Thursday and now we're meeting on the last Thursday. Um, as a result, Judy's been able to give us an extra half hour, so that's good. So we're here till 8.30 every night. And we're starting a half hour early as well. Um, try to give a bit more time for presentations because we've been finding them rushed. Uh, so the next meeting, February 28th, end of, end of February. Um, we, we've got to sort of get out of here quickly at the end of our, our meeting and just head over to the other room because there's usually something on after us, like a band or something like that, and they need to set up. And um, every month we get sometimes a person who doesn't ever settle up their bill and they just kind of run out and it really annoys free time. So it, don't forget to talk to the server and settle it up. And uh, we've got a video channel on Vimeo and the videos are linked on our website. So we're uh, thanks to Andrew for filming these and uh, we've been putting up our presentations. So definitely take a look at that and share them if you know anyone who can't make it to the actual meetings and is interested in the topics. Send them a link, get them to join the mailing list and they can check everything out online. Um, we've also got a Google Plus community going uh, with a few of our members in it and it's called Toronto Java User Group and um, there's a link you can download the slides after the meeting and uh, just click on that and it's a very convenient URL you can just easily just t type that in and off you go so yeah definitely check that out um, Jeff has been not here he's been posting our, our news to it and it's the same kind of thing. I mean, maybe eventually it will replace the mailing list, or I, I don't know. It's not particularly different from the mailing list. Jeff created it um, because he used to mail us the news items just privately. I don't know. I guess he felt that it would create too much noise on the mailing list. Um, and with these community things, you can choose how much notification you want to get when something's posted all the way from, like, send me an email down to don't tell me at all. Um, so I guess Jeff thought that it would be easier on people. They could join the community, and if they want notifications when something gets posted, they can. Yep, so, I mean, if you're on Google+, Plus, it's pretty much just one click to get going on it, and it's kind of fun. Um, okay, so our news this month, uh, some of it from Jeff and some of it from just some research. Uh, what was that? The perils of using an iPhone. Uh, lots of exciting security problems this, uh, this month with Java and uh, the Department of Homeland Security asks everyone to disable your Java and don't use it anymore. <laughs> um, there's just been some problems with the Java plugin in browsers and uh, problems with busting out of the sandbox and applets being able to do things they shouldn't be able to do with your computer. Um, it was uh, mostly announced this exploit on January 2nd and it took Oracle a full two weeks to patch it or even respond to the, the, uh, the exploit, which is a bit frustrating. Um, there's a blog post from Tim Boudreau, uh, which is linked at the bottom. Um, and it's a, a very, very good explanation of what happened with the exploit and how it works with, with MBeans and the class loader and how people are able to get out of the sandbox and it's definitely worth the read. And uh, if you've installed uh, update 11 of Java 7, then you're mostly in the clear. Yes, and there's also uh, some secret updates from uh, Oracle where they're, they've started to auto remove Java 6 from your computer. So if you're running Windows and you just update your Java, your Java 6 may disappear. And Enterprise users have been having problems with that because they've been, you know, using native integration and having problems where their users, their apps don't run anymore and they can't figure out why and it's because all their DLLs have moved around and all sorts of strange problems. So Oracle has not been handling that probably as well as they could be. 
It probably should have warranted another update to Java 6, even though they promised they wouldn't give any more. Yes. Um, right after the Java Update 11 came out, um, a bunch of the hacker groups posted that there is an exploit available that breaks the Update 11. Um, it's still pretty quiet. Um, I think they're still trying to sell it. Yeah. I think uh, this, I, is our, this is our fifth month in a row that we've announced a Java security exploit. Yeah. So if you're using applets with your customers, just maybe don't. It's <laughs> just not a good idea. So we haven't heard from Oracle. There's been no 7U12. We don't know what's going on with that. Um, more exciting Java news. Um, Jcash, which is the big Java caching API, um, is not going to make it into EE7. And uh, they tried. They didn't quite get the deadlines. And uh, they've been working on it since March 2001. It's one of the oldest JSRs that's still open. And uh, we'll see if they, they're, they're aiming for EE8 now. See, in like 20, 2014, 2015? EE8? Yeah. Uh, yeah, two years after, so. All right. Uh, yeah, so two years from now. Uh, Groovy 2.1 came out, which is very exciting, and it has full support for Invoke Dynamic. Uh, which is the new Java 7 feature that gives dynamic programming um, a lot of help with the compiler and higher performance. Uh, and it also bundles GPARS, which used to be an optional add-on, and that's the Groovy's awesome parallel library. So if you're doing any parallel programming, it's really worth checking out. It makes things very easy uh, using the closures. And you can just basically say, run this closure in parallel, 100 times in parallel, and off it goes. It's very, very easy to use. Uh, the new Java Magazine, January, February issue is out. So you can, you can go and check that on Oracle's website. Um, you have to fill out a fairly long and intensive form about everything in your personal life to read it. But uh, once you do that, um, it's, it's actually pretty good. It's, it's nicely designed. It looks like a real magazine. It's very professional. Uh, so it's, it's worth a read. It's free. You just have to sign up and give them Marketing info. Uh, Hudson 3.0 has come out from the Eclipse Foundation. So Oracle and the Hudson people had a falling out, and Jenkins was created, and then Oracle gave up on Hudson and gave it to the Eclipse Foundation. And they've been working on it. And they've made a release, which I guess is competing with Jenkins now. Um, they've added a plugin manager. They've improvised the UI. And uh, <laughs> they're, um, they're working. They don't seem to acknowledge Jenkins at all in their, in their marketing materials or talking about it. So I don't know if they're sharing code or if there's any collaboration or what's happening between the two. So it's, it's a very opaque sort of thing. They're just like, yay, Hudson 3.0. So check that out. It looks nice. It's, they've updated the UI. It's a, it's a lot more modern looking. but. I, I don't know. Um, there's been a lot of excitement with Java ARM. It's uh, maybe Oracle's attempt to compete with Android a little bit, but uh, they've got very good support in JDK 7, JDK 8. Uh, they've recently released Java FX capable releases. Um, so if you have an ARM 6 or ARM 7 device, you can get yep. pretty good. Spot Sorry? Yes, there's a commercial at the end. No, no. But any of yes, hotspots available. There's um, an Oracle download that you can get for all of them with hotspot. Yeah. Uh, it used to be the ARM six with hotspot didn't have GUI, but it does now. Uh, it's very cool. We're running your stuff on a Raspberry Pi. And the 3D works quite well. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's uh, 3D libraries using. Uh, yes. Two. Mm. Right. So yeah, if you haven't played with the Java embedded stuff, um, there's a really popular little computer called the Raspberry Pi, which is about $40. You can grab it. It's a little board. Take some micro SD card and no, full size. Full size SD. Yeah. yeah. Just plugs in, and you can install Linux and Java and code away. So if you need something small and cheap to put a Java application on, then it's uh, it's worth a try. It's a lot of fun. 
they're really easy to use. I think you can buy them at Creatron, which is just over at Spadina and College. They have all sorts of fun accessories for them, too. They have some small LCD monitors and various Wi-Fi adapters. You can build your own phone. Yeah, because we had someone come in uh, from Sheridan College to our office at Red Hat and sort of talk about, because they had done a lot of work reporting um, um, Fedora so that it would run on a Raspberry Pi. And he told the whole story, like the backstory about where this Raspberry Pi came from. And it was basically, it was a, the system on a chip was meant to be a video card. And he talked his employer into making the, the silicon die include an ARM processor and some RAM. So now they've shipped over half a million units. Yeah. Mm. So they, it was wise of them to say yes. Because they've sold a lot more probably for this purpose than for the original. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. You can pick a. Yeah, it's a good if you want to make a pocket-sized web server, or I don't know, you can run pretty much everything on it. Um, some interesting stuff on the Nashorn blog, which is the new JavaScript uh, embedded language implementation for Java, replacing Rhino. Um, it's out. It's in JDK 8. They've fully integrated it. So if you download a JDK 8 pre-release build, um, you can use it. Um, DevOx 2012 have released a talk on Nashorn. So if you want to get a good introduction to it, there's a link on the slide. And, uh, or you can go to parlays.com and you can, you can find it if you browse to DevOx 2012 and check it out. But uh, if you're using any JavaScript and Java integration, scriptable applications, that kind of thing, um, it's really easy to use. And this is supposed to be super high performance with the, this, this Nashorn thing. I haven't tried it myself, but it uh, looks really cool. Conference calendar hasn't really changed since last month. Uh, we have JFocus coming up next week. Um, EclipseCon. Uh, DevOps UK, which is new and nobody's ever been there before. This is their first, first try at it. Uh, the CFP is open, I think, until later tonight. Yeah. Or it may have just closed, so um, if you didn't get your papers in, well, maybe, maybe next year. And um, we have a, a discount for EclipseCon, so if anybody's interested in going to that, you can use our promo code and get a discount, yeah. almost. All right. Uh, so that's, that's that for the news, and today we've got a presentation from uh, Marius and Jonathan on uh, the new Java API for JSON processing, which isn't out yet. Uh, it's going to be in EE7, and uh, it's just going to be in available for general Java use as well. Yes, there's no uh, EE dependencies. So that's very cool. So I'll hand, uh, hand it over to them. So as Dan said, we're here to talk about JSR 353, which introduces a standardized uh, JSON parser and, and generator for Java. And it's going to be part of Java EE 7. So it should be available on any Java EE app server you're deploying your app to without you needing to include any additional jars. Um, so starting off, what's JSON? I'm guessing everybody here knows already, but we'll just go over the basics for a refresher. Get out of curiosity. How many of you are using applications or are building applications that use JSON? Yes. Welcome to the modern age. Yes. It's hard to escape these days. So very quickly, we've got some types. We have a value type for Boolean, value type for strings, a value type for numbers, which are uh, they can have decimal places in exponential notation. Uh, value type for null. And then we have two kind of structural types. One is objects, which are key value pairs, where the key is a string always, and the value is any other JSON type, including a nested object. And finally, we have arrays, which can include any type, including other arrays. So how does JSR 353 break all this down? I'm, I'm sure, since everybody here already uses JSON in their Java apps, you know there's a, a whole bunch of different JSON libraries to choose from. Right. Um, and they're all slightly different. And this is no exception. But uh, so what's in JSR 353? Well, these are mostly the, the value types. The ones that are this teal color are all immutable 
So once you've created one of these types of things, you can't modify its contents. Um, and that's about all there is to say about them. There, there are interfaces now. That's been going back and forth, but I, I think it was decided earlier today um, that these are now interfaces rather than objects. So that uh, implementation libraries can choose their own favorite representation for them. And then this JSON type at the top is kind of the, the place you go to to get instances of all of the JSON types. And then there's kind of uh, two sides to the whole thing. Uh, so sharing in all of the value types, uh, if you add in these other four types, JSON Array Builder, JSON Object Builder, JSON Reader, and JSON Writer, now you have a complete solution for working in this sort of XML DOM-like environment where you have the whole tree of objects in memory and you can walk through them by enumerating the children and, and so on. Uh, so that's very familiar. I think pretty much every JSON library I've worked with offers this functionality in some way or another. And then there's another side to JSR 353, which is the streaming API, which works more like, using the XML analogy again, it works more like Stacks, the streaming API for XML. So with this, what, what we add in are the JSON generator things, which allow you to output JSON sort of one token at a time. And it's really down, we'll, we'll get into this in a minute, but it's really down to the level of, okay, now I want you to start an object. Now here's a, here's a key here's a value, and it, it's very low level. You just give it one thing at a time, and it goes straight out and output stream. So you can use this to process very large documents without a big memory footprint. So going down a level of abstraction, so looking at the types, the, this JSON type allows you to create any of these things, which are from the the in-memory tree side, so the reader and the writer, and then also the four types that you can use for the streaming API for reading and writing. We'll actually see how. Yeah, 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 we're gonna do coding and, and stuff, so. This is just an overview. So the value types, these are, these are at the core of, of what you're going to be working with all the time when you're using this API. So this is how the, the value types break down in JSR 353. We have JSON value at the top, and all of the value types are some subtype of JSON value. Uh, we have true and false represented as um, static final fields on the interface, and they're just anonymous types. So you have JSON value dot true and JSON value dot false are your constants for that. Null is defined in the same way. So JSON value dot null represents a null in the in the message. Uh, then we have strings and numbers, and the two structural types that, that contain values have a common supertype called JSON structure. If you look at this map, like if you look at this diagram, the interesting part is that actually what you were typically going to work with is mostly at the bottom. So you will most of the time work with a JSON object or a JSON array, and that particular JSON object or JSON array is going to have properties of the JSON string, JSON number type. And somehow, the JSR itself has tried to somehow unify the type system like by having everything derived from JSON value. And you will see in the API, actually, the JSON value, uh, the fact that the JSON value is the actual root of the whole hierarchy used quite a lot. Okay. Yes. But in the end, what you're looking at, you're looking at basically these two, there's like two separate objects with each one with its own paradigm. It's actually not even paradigm, you're actually extending the, uh, they're implementing the interfaces. This an object is essentially a map of strings and JSON values, and JSON array is essentially a an index list of uh, JSON values. Right. So that doesn't get any much simpler than that. So how would you go about using, say, the tree side of the, of the JSON API? So do, why don't you talk through this? OK, sure. I can, we can do that. So basically, this is, let's say, what you saw on the left side. It's the object graph model of, Java, uh, of uh, JSON handling. I wouldn't say parsing, because um, it's used for both reading and writing JSON objects. 
everything at the end of the day comes down to, as I said, reducing ray, JSON object. But you cannot, you can, you can acquire these objects in different ways. You can either parse them from a given document using a JSON reader. So you can just go there, feed in, feed in the document. The document can actually come in from a stream or a reader or whatever. But basically, it's a stream or a reader or a string. And that produces one of the two objects that we said. However, you can construct them. You can construct them. Like, you have this uh, fluid interface. We'll actually show you how to construct it when we do the actual live coding part. You have the array builder for building, oh well, arrays. And you have the object builder for building JSON objects. So you have this very, uh, like at, at some point you can talk about the JSON DSL for creating, well, JSON documents. When you have those objects created, you can actually produce a doc, like you can produce a, a serialized JSON out of them by using the JSON writer. You just pass on either the array or the object, the JSON writer takes them and produces the, like, serializes them in, 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 in the JSON format. And of course, the API itself has some other shortcuts. So for example, we can actually shortcut. We can take the array builder, which represents a built, a pre-built object, and pass it on to the writer and so on. But this is more like tricks. What you should take out of all this is that you have two mechanisms for actually producing the, uh, uh, the, op like the, uh, the object, the array or the object, which is either the reader or the builders. And then the same, like in reverse, you have the right, the writer mechanism for actually resolizing them to, uh, to get okay, your string back out. Yeah. So now uh, the the streaming API, it's a little more complicated to use, um, mostly because it's much lower level than 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 the object tree type API. So I in short. Uh, you get a JSON parser, uh, which you can use the factory for, or you can just get one directly if you don't care where it came from. Um, and you feed in, again, uh, a string that represents a JSON message or document. And what you get back are events, and they're very low-level events, like this. Like, oh, I think there's a typo there. You'd get like the JSON event representing an array started. And then that should be like an open curly brace a JSON yeah, yeah, parser yeah, event saying an object has started. That's, that's, that's and then you get an event saying, hey, I just found a key value pair. And it's A is the key, and 2 is the value. And that's the, the level that you work at. So usually this would be in, in like a loop with, with case statements. Um, and we'll code through one of these so you can yeah. see exactly how it works. Uh, and then in reverse, if you want to get a string back out, uh, you use a JSON generator, and you start feeding it events. Um, so in this case, we're feeding it events like we feed it this one, start an, start an array, start an object, put a key value mapping in, end the object, end the array, and then you end up with that. It's like one thing that we discussed, like Jonathan and I we were discussing about putting together these slides was whether to call the uh, parser an actual tokenizer or not. And it's not a tokenizer, although it produces tokens. What it does, it, it's doing a little bit more than that. It's kind of it's producing the lexical structure of your JSON document. However, it's kind of aware of whether the document is compliant to the, the grammar, so it's structurally sound. So mm -hmm. we'll check. It's stateful. Uh, you won't like you have the guarantee that if you didn't get an exception while produce like or parsing this document, your for example your array opening event will be followed by an array closing event. That's kind of a guarantee. That's that's a contract. Um, well, otherwise it's in, in between, it's, it's gonna, uh, you're going to throw an exception to the stream. And it's the same with the JSON generator. I mean, if you send, you can, if you send some like, nonsensical stream of, uh, of uh, um, um, tokens, like you open an array, you open the object, and you open a, another array again, and then you close the object and do some crazy stuff like that, it'll probably it, it'll, it'll break. So it kind of guarantees that you're creating a, a sound docking. It's in that uh, respect. And that's structurally important. valid. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, because it's part of this Java EE7 umbrella spec, there was an opportunity to integrate it with other parts of Java EE7 right away. Um, so the one integration that has happened now that's been agreed to is that JAXRS will specify 
that when it's deployed in an, in an enterprise container, you'll be allowed to accept uh, any JSON structure, which means effectively an object or an array, as an argument to one of your JAXRS methods. And similarly, you can return any JSON structure from one of your JAXRS methods. And the JAXRS container will do the right thing and serialize it out for you or parse it if it's coming in. And you know, where is that good? Like, where, where, what is that good for? It's basically good because a lot of times when you want to process JSON, like it frees you from the need of creating all kinds of intermediate objects that you use just to do the, the JSON binding, binding to object, and so on and so forth. You can basically, uh, which is kind of more restrictive in the sense that you really have to have the, like you have to really have to have an agreed bound con contract between the JSON structure and the Java type that you're binding to. This is kind of more permissive in the sense that you're going to receive a JSON object and you can have more flexibility basically in the service. Yeah, it can be um, more, more dynamically typed this more way. More dynamically typed yeah. this way. So that's really the whole thing. It's not a giant spec because it shouldn't need to be. Um, so the question is what next? What, what could be built upon this foundation? And the number one question that a lot of people have asked uh, me directly and, and on the mailing list is what about uh, object binding? Like, if you've worked with JAXB before, the Java API for XML binding, it's, we kind of take it for granted that you can have this XML document come in and something will magically map it onto Java objects for you. And of course, there are libraries that do this with JSON, uh, like Jackson does it. Um, our stuff does it. A lot of, there are a lot of examples of this thing, where we take a Java object and produce a JSON message that's structurally similar to it. Uh, this, well, you know, because we finished t talking about every single class in this API now, uh, JSR 353 doesn't define anything like that, but of course it's a foundation upon which someone could build that. And I think the general expectation is that something like that, something like JAXB for JSON will come out with EE8, and it will build on this. Uh, but until then, um, just, a, just a question. Yep. I don't, I don't mean to heckle you here, but like JSON binding, I, like is what I use in my application everywhere. Yep. It's inconceivable to me that I would actually sit there and use these low-level types, right? Understand the value of having that as yep. part of the toolkit. What was the reasoning? For like completely not doing anything about binding, like was there some technical reason? That's no, no. <laughs> I don't have a good answer for that. It's, it's, a, it's well, one one thing that is an, like one thing where this specification is important <coughs> is basically that it introduces streaming, which is like. Something that binding cannot and cannot ever solve. Like if you right. No. I mean, I, I, like I said, I'm not arguing for the value of, of it. It's just like it's just like like s when I hear, oh, enterprise Java is going to get uh, Jack, uh, JSON uh, API. Right. I go like, this is totally useless for my day-to-day -day use case, and would probably be for a lot of developers that are already using things like Jackson, because like this is like nobody's going to sit there and rewrite their code or write a lot more code to this. Yeah. Like really, who uses who uses like you know the the DOM APIs for Java or like right. the the streaming ones for high performance situations maybe specialized cases, but it just honestly seems like a, we're gonna have to wait too long by that point to be irrelevant the standard whatever it is be like logging all over again. Yeah, I agree. I for like the vast majority of use cases, you want to map the JSON data to and from Java objects. And so nobody, nobody in their right mind would, would abandon Jackson and, and use this. So point, point taken, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I don't think you're missing anything. Why is this an EE API and not an NFT? Well, I don't know if it's an EE API as such. It's its, it's, its own JSR, and it, it's based on Java SE 7 as its baseline. It's just being included in the Java EE7 umbrella JSR so that you'll have a guarantee that it's there when you deploy to an EE7 container. But I, this JSR on its own, not, not counting the fact that it's under that umbrella, is, is an SE API. So will be part of the SE? 
be. I'm not aware of any plans to put it in core Java SE, but you know, Jigsaw is coming, so it, I'm I sure it will be some sort of automatic dependency sooner or later. I think a lot of the a lot of the approach to Gen Z will change with Jigsaw anyway. So yeah, when there's no more monolithic core library that they'll be able to include all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Um, and so JSON path was something Marius and I thought would be really handy to build on top of this and maybe include in a future standard, but uh, so JSON path is, as its name implies, it's a lot like XPath, again, drawing parallels to XML. Um, so it's a little query language for JSON messages. So you, you can do basically all the kind of XPathy type things. Uh, JSON path is a little bit simpler because there's not the difference between attributes and, and objects uh, or el entities, elements, elements yes. Um, so there's not as many axes that you can diverge along in a JSON path expression, but it's very familiar to anyone who's used XPath to, to search through an XML document. Um, we feel like it would be useful to, to have something like that. Especially when we look at, like, especially when we look at JSON, it's not necessarily as, a, not only as a representation of an object, like something that happened to be, but as we actually as a structured document in its own right. So, right. So, so enough so talk. Sorry, this yep. Yeah. Like yeah. Um, See you later. So is this? Are there periods instead of like slashes in XPath? Is that what I'm seeing? Yes. No. Why wouldn't they just use XPath? Because XML and JSON are like so similar. They are. The differences are, are so minute. Yeah. Why wouldn't we just stick with um, with uh, XPath? Well, that's certainly a, a question that could be visited if someone was trying to standardize this. This, yeah. this is, uh, I just lifted this from a Google code <laughs> project that implements JSON path in Java. Is it XPath superfluous though? Does it have features that... Don't XPath has a lot of features you wouldn't need for JSON. Because uh, it has this whole all idea of axes. Stuff, yeah, you can probably get rid of. Yeah. All the, the element, you know, descendant, mm -hmm. children, whatever. All that stuff still that works. All the same. Yeah. Um, yeah, slashes would work. It's. I think is my guess. It's only a guess because it also depends on how you look at it. Some developers may not recognize looking at an attribute via a slash as a familiar idea, for example. So it, it depends. It depends how you look at it. Kind of taking the the JavaScript analogy that JSON started with and yeah. extending it to use the dot as the as the object refinement operator. Yeah, but at the end of the day, you need an expression language, whether it's XPath or something else. It's yeah. jQuery selectors. <laughs> jQuery selectors. Well, those those work on more <laughs> XML-y type documents. Yeah. yeah. But you could. Could you? No. Because a lot of those queries are based on attributes, right, and element types. So you don't have either. I, I think um, one thing that I can talk about regarding binding versus a really solid object API is um, the, uh, a lot of the binding APIs are very, very poor at handling faults in the input data. And I, I don't know, I guess it goes back to send mail, but there's a, a concept you should be very tolerant of your inputs and very precise in your outputs. And with a binding API, it's usually all or nothing. Your data either parses and goes, fits the binding yeah. and gets bound, or it fails completely. And right. if you're working with input data that may be a little bit sketchy, which JSON data often is, it makes a lot of sense to be able to access it with a, an object API. Mm -hmm. usually, usually when you have, like, Usually when you use binding even for XML, for, for, so like for any kind of web service, and usually you go with a binding strategy, you end up with the problem of what happens if the contract changes from one version to the other, and not all the clients are, t are speaking it or something like that. You want to upgrade the protocol. What are you going to do? You have to be fairly dynamic in how you handle it, I thought. Yeah, so that's, that's a good point. So enough talk. Should we start typing? See, Strong typing. see how it works? Strong typing with JavaScript. OK, now we do. So this is, this is the spec here. The other, the other one is the implementation, which is part of Glassfish officially. But here's the spec that we just talked about. So that's the entire API. What you see here is also some exceptions that we haven't 
mention. We didn't talk about the exceptions. Right. So let's look at um, some example JSON documents. This is the one, we had that hack day back in November. And this was the data we played with that day. It's from a website that, you found it, didn't you, Mike? It's called lcvoapi.com, and it has up-to-date stock information about what all the LCVO stores are carrying. Um, so it's a pretty typical looking JSON data set. It's like an array of objects that are all very similar in, in uh, which keys they have. Uh, we've also got this. This is the Twitter uh, tweet stream data. So this, this just came straight from the Twitter developer API web page. Um, there's a surprising amount of metadata on tweets I, I didn't even realize. Yeah, tell me about it. When I'm roaming and I like basically like turn my roaming on and refresh Twitter, it's like, oh look, I just use 1.2 megabytes of data. Yeah. How is this possible? So this is a fairly rich <laughs> API uh, or data structure in terms of what what you can dig through. And you can see it gets quite nested in, in places. So it's an interesting one to play with as well when you're looking at, at accepting some sort of JSON data and doing something with it. So uh, I guess let's start by, what do you want to do first? Should we create some JSON or should we parse some JSON? Anybody care? Who's for parsing? All right. Yeah. Parse it. Parse it. I say you create it and parse it, and then emit code and parse it again. Just yeah. Okay. Create, create, create a whole workflow that just never ends. That sounds like an excellent idea. <laughs> okay. So just call this live code. Oops. Just put here. You sure you don't want to? Yeah. 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 No. Go ahead. Okay, so what are we parsing it first with? Uh, we're gonna let's use, use the, the tree API. Tree API. Easier. Okay, so first we're gonna create. Um, oh, this is not the very newest thing. Okay, right. so we're gonna say new JSON, JSON reader. reader. This is actually changed now. The the change hasn't been committed. That's all. Uh, well, what we have shown you basically earlier was that all the instances of API objects that you work with would be acquired by, <coughs> like from the JSON class, like from the JSON class, which actually we won't do in this example because just because we have an older version of the API, which actually required using constructors for creating this um, like the reader that. or something like that. So basically, what what uh, Jonathan is doing right now is creating the reader object and passing on the, um, the actual stream of data that we will uh, parse into a uh, JSON object. So the next thing to do is just to read it. And here you have different options. You basically can read the, uh, like read the content and return whatever is there. And if you remember the super type of JSON object and JSON array was JSON structures, you can just have this method. Or you can specifically ask, like you can specifically read, um, re read the object as a, uh, knowing exactly what you're expecting. Now, of course, if you try to read an array from a JSON document that is, a, that is an object, that's, you're going to have a bad time. Um, and that, that is pretty much it. If you see the, um, like, the read operation has actually returned a JSON array. I think there's actually a better way of doing that. We can get it, we can get the value type. Mm -hmm. And there it is. Actually, it's, it starts with a vowel in either case, so we can use an N there. Yeah, but that's <laughs> just because they're just, you <laughs> start with vowels, like both types. Both types. Yeah. Okay, so now what do we do? Uh, we can print it out. Let's try to, can we try to read some properties? Okay. So let's uh, Let's iterate. It. Maybe you should iterate and read some property of it. Okay, so let's see what we're gonna expect here. So the outer wrapper is an array, and then inside we have a series of objects. 
Right. So maybe we can print out the uh, text <coughs> of each text. tweet. The text it would be perfect. Okay. So let's do that. Let's write. Um, I have to go to uh, what was it called? Live code. Okay. So we go for JSON object tweet. Mm -hmm. um, mm. Oh, we're actually going to need to cast this here. So right. just we can actually, like, w now that you show them that it's actually an object, we can just read it as an array and that's yeah. it. And it's fine. To import it, I think. There we go. Okay. And we can read it as an array. So, so it's we'll go uh, read dot get value okay, so this get. This has changed as well. Right now, what we have to do is we have to iterate over it. It's a, it implements list at the moment. No. Uh, it's supposed to. No, because it's, oh, it's oh, oh, JSON oh, value. Value. It, yeah. This is the thing. Well, the API has changed a little bit, and it's made, made things a little bit friendlier for get, getting. Like, wh one of the challenges that you have when you read an array is that you don't know exactly what the content of the array is going to be. It can be a simple string. Or it can be a composite object, or it can be another array, right? So the API itself has tried to solve this problem by creating these very generic supertypes and then having the arrays being of, their, of those particular supertypes. However, in practice, as a user, you would mostly use, like you would kind of know what kind of content you expect. So um, for doing that, um, there are specific methods that allow you to retrieve values of, of uh, to retrieve values as a sp of a specific type and say, well, I know that this is going to be an object. I'm going to retrieve it as an object. So those are, right now, you can get the Boolean, you can get an integer, you can get a string, and anything else you have to use this construction here, which is, um, well, let's look for one that isn't uh, one of those and we'll try to pull it out. Close these things for a minute. Do, do, do. Okay. So let's try pulling out user, because that's an object. Mm -hmm. Oops. We can read users. So we go tweet dot get. See there's no get object, so we have to use get value. Of user. So that's how you grab an object out of an object. And then what do we want to do? Maybe we'll just print out the user. So something we didn't mention, but is probably expected, is that every JSON values to string method produces valid JSON when you, when you call it. The reason that there's the JSON writer is because it gives you formatting options that you don't have with to string. That get value is a generic. Return. Yeah. Get value returns the type. Yeah, get value returns the type of the second parameter that you pass in. Does it attempt to do any any conversion? If you say call get int on a string, will it? You can. You get a class cast exception. I think. So I think the only. If it is int data, it won't try to. It won't the only interchangeable that. types no. are basically number and string in the sense that if you have something, if you have a number, you can return it as a string, and that's pretty much it. Yeah. So let's say we want to print out the user with some formatting. So instead of that. We can say new JSON writer. writer. System that out is a print stream, so I don't know if you can, that's good. Yep. Oops. And then we'll say dot write. Where is it? There it is. You have to write. You have to write the object, and you can write the user. User. Of course, that's a resource leak, so we need to. 
this out. Is that a resource leak? Well, not really, but it's going to be like static analysis tools will warn you that it is. Is it auto-parsable? Yes. So there was a big discussion about this, and I was actually mis... I was... Uh, well, because it wasn't originally, right, when we looked at it? It wasn't, but it turns out that in Java 7, I didn't know this, uh, auto-closable is um, a super type of closable. So all closables are auto-closables. And they did that because auto-closable is allowed to... The close method is allowed to throw any exception. And closable refines that down to I.O. exception. So all closables are auto-closables. And I, we didn't know that on the hack day. Yeah. So that I, I learned that later because I wasn't aware. OK, so we should see a formatted user object come out now. No, we need formatting options. This also changed. This is now a map. There used to be a special type for configuration, but it's changed now to just map. So we could declare those up here, I guess, to say like map. How do we find out what the formatting? Mm. It should be constants. It's actually I'm a, I'm at a loss now. This ch there. Okay, so now we have printed out the user with some indentation and formatting. No. That was discussed. I, I think it was four spaces. It's That's four. That's what Douglas says. Crockford says. Four. Yeah. Four. It's exactly four. What about the location of braces? <laughs> <laughs> Brace location. That's always a sticky issue. And are, are they tabs or spaces? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> These things matter deeply. Okay. Uh, so that's Probably, is there anything, <coughs> anything big we missed in terms of the object tree API? Should we move on to the? No, I think we're fine. So we've done, we've done parsing, we've done writing. Oh, I know what we're missing. We're missing the, um, the builder. Oh, the builder, yeah, to produce an object. So that's important. Let's do this. Let's get a list of the um, but I think usernames. What's that? Is there an option to change an object to a builder? You can build and you can pre-build. Yes, there is. So we can just um. try to change the user. We'll try and collect usernames first. Right. So we'll say user dot get string. Oh, by the way, one of one of the last questions that's being considered it's is the string name. I don't actually know if it's name. Well, I think it's username. The username. It's name. 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 Okay. And we want to do uh, usernames. Add. That should give us a list. And then at the end, we can use the builder to print out the usernames in a JSON array. Is that after the list? Yeah. So we'll go um, JSON dot. No, it's so the builder, the builder will also builder. be from there when this goes final. That's like happening tomorrow, probably. But right now, we see new JSON builder. No, what am I doing wrong? JSON, JSON array object builder. or array builder. Yeah. Actually, we could probably just start chaining calls here. Dot add. Oh, oh no, 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 no! We have to do it. Do we have to iterate. iterate. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, getting ahead of myself. Uh, 
add username. And this, um, there's a lot, add is really overloaded. It's like, um, it takes all of the types you would want, pretty much. So if you want to add a JSON string, you just add a string. That's what we did. Uh, and you can use anything, or if you have a JSON value lying around, you can add that directly. Okay, and then we can just print it. The ray build. Builder dot build. Build. And it didn't happen. Nothing happened. Oh, okay. You should at least have made little brackets. Something creepy is going on. Let's not print this. Oh, there they are. Probably, maybe oh, the writer, maybe the writer was doing something funny. Anyway, so that's, that's how the builder works. The builder also, if you look in the Java doc, um, it returns itself just like string builder does. So you can do this kind of fluent style building of JSON objects by chaining the calls to add. OK, so should we look at the streaming API? Let's go there. OK, let's do it. So this one, we actually do start from JSON. Create the parser. So the first thing is to go and create the parser for the input stream, which is going to be the same uh, document that we looked before. But what, we were gonna s what you're going to see right now is the difference that while um, while processing the document, we're actually reading tokens from the input stream one by one. Tokens which are actually reflected as events. So any anything, basically any uh, any lexical element in the um, um, in the document is actually results in an event, right? And you can actually check the type, like the way the way you work with it, and it's actually a really really low level API. Is that we can look at, like we can print out the types of the type of events. Which is what we do right now, right? I so, the wrong thing. I ran the wrong thing. I ran. So uh, there is the. S this is the stream actually of 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 tokens of events actually that come in, right? And it reproduces exactly the structure of the um, of the uh, <coughs> JSON document. And as you see, you also get things like. Um, not only object start, object end, and so on and so forth, but you actually get events like the key, or whether it's a key or a value or whatever. It's kind of your job to reconstruct the information by processing the document correctly. Yeah. Um, does this make use of any like Java closure features for doing some of the iteration and handling the events? Yeah. Well, it was it was designed with that in mind. But the baseline JDK for this JSR is Java 7. So it's really just, it's designed knowing that Java 8 and Lambdas are coming. So the intention was to basically not spoil the fun when Lambdas are available. But it has to work in Java 7. Um, it will probably end up being that uh, things like this, like Parser, end up um, implementing streamable when the baseline moves up to Java 8 so that you can use a chain of lambdas to process them and you can use reductions and filters and all the rest of it. Yeah. Um, 
But for now, it is not streamable, so you wouldn't be able to directly use this parser with, with Lambdas. Um, so we want to do uh, the token type. Right. So that's. Oh, it is. It is an enum. So it's, it's just that. Next. So now, y you have to kind of manage your own state here because all, all this matched was the opening curly bracket. It doesn't. We don't actually know anything about the object yet. Awesome. You have to sing the code. <laughs> sing as long as they don't play uh, like Eye of the Tiger or something, it's fine. <laughs> so let's see. Um, we're searching for string values. I think it would be interesting. The object is not really that interesting right. to us. Maybe we could s just look at, for example, like just extract names again as an example. Usernames. Sure. Case value uh, key name. If parser dot get string dot equals name, name. right? Uh, then we probably want to go parser dot next, right? And the other then this, right? The other the other thing is here is that basically you can parse like with as in any. You actually drive the parsing, so you can. Once you detected something, you can start reading a lot of stuff from the stream as much as you want. And I think one of the enhancements that was discussed at some point but never made it was to actually be able to read an entire object and do something like that from the parser. Like Jonathan yes. can correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, that was discussed. It's, it's not in here, but yeah. right, never made it. So if you had a key, you know, the next thing is going to be the Yes. Uh, it's go you're going to get an exception when you do the next, basically. So, being streaming, you don't know what's coming next, but yeah. if it returns successfully, then everything went fine. <laughs> what we don't have here is context, so it has happened now that there were more than that one type of object that had a, uh, an object with a name field. So we got all of them, and, and we don't know because we didn't keep track of it ourselves which object those names belonged to. Because remember, there were only two tweets in the data, and we've ended up with what's six names. It's basically anything that has an, like anything that has a name that called name in this document. Yeah. So this is a very low-level API, and the, the code gets quite big. I did this to completion with um, this parser example, so you can see. This, this is the kind of code you're going to end up with if you want to use the, the pull parser. You'll have to check things and keep your own state as you iterate through. And then in the end object, you, you're going to make your decision. So the, the point of this one was to go through LCBO API and count the inventory of all the logger beers. So what I had to do is capture the names of every single object that came through with a primary category, a secondary category, or a name. And when the object ends, only then can we make a decision because we've collected all of the information. Right. And so even, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Now I was saying that in, and in, in this case, we're kind of fortunate that we know that only something that has primary category or secondary category or something like that is one, is one of our valid targets. In the previous example where we used name, we had no idea. So basically, you would have to kind of track how deep are you are in the like navigating, how many objects have started so far, what properties are these objects assigned to, and so on yeah. and so forth. So you have to think really hard whether you're going to be processing giant documents where it's worth this amount of trouble to save the memory, because that's really the advantage here is that you're never loading the entire document into memory. In all other ways, it's it's much harder to use and less desirable, but. Uh, sometimes the documents are huge, so it's good that it's available. Do you know if the parser has a location? It, there? That's a great question. In my experience, it hasn't appeared to, but 
I could be wrong. That's really up to the implementation. Like when it throws an exception, for example, whether it knows what character it was at. Yeah. Uh, but that's a very good question. Is the JSON parser interface geared up to give you that information? Nope. No. No, no it doesn't. It's that's, uh, that's something that's probably worth bringing up. I think the XML streaming APIs have that. Yes. It's implementation, whether or not, it's not whether or not it will return an actual object. That's right, yeah, because there's that location type in there. Yeah. I know because I use it right now. <laughs> so. Yeah, so you're right. Uh, coding against this API directly, you'd have a very hard time producing good error messages when you run into a problem. Unless the implementation puts that information in the exception. I think probably that's pretty good feedback for it. <laughs> that's very good feedback. So we'll definitely bring that up because, yeah, kind of like that. Great. The last fish implementation is the only thing. It will just be the first. There's it's, no other it's the reference implementation. And is anyone else working on something right now that you know? Not that I know of. We, we are interested in implementing this in Array. Because our use case, just quickly, is uh, in Google Web Toolkit. It's, it's a compiler that translates Java to JavaScript. And so you write Java code, but it actually, when it's running, it's in the browser. Um, and so you have access to all of the browser's, browser's native functionality, which, of course, it's very good at parsing JSON quickly. And what it gives you back are all of its own native JavaScript objects when you parse the JSON. So we were really interested in implementing this API so you can do JSON processing using the same API on the server and the client. But we want the implementation to be as efficient as possible. So that's why we're happy that um, these types of things, like JSON string, have become interfaces. Because we can just pretend that, uh, that a native JavaScript string in the browser is actually a JSON string. Um, so that's a useful property of this API is that we'll be able to implement it efficiently in the Google Web Toolkit. But we haven't done that yet. So. Well, um, I think we've touched on everything except how you would make an implementation, and that's this type, JSON provider. I think we didn't touch on the generator. Oh, the generator. Well, yeah. it's just like the parser, but in reverse. <laughs> we, we can do it if you want. Um, so we'll go here. We'll generate something. Maybe we'll accumulate these names. Yeah. But we can we can generate them while we're parsing them, right? While we. Uh, yeah, sure. Why not? Yeah, we don't need to accumulate them. So I we have to go JSON dot create generator. System out. Here we'll go. I think we need to start the array. Yes, we do. Before we'll do that up here. Right. Uh, right, start array. And close array. I think. have to uh, flush or something? Mm, yeah, I think flush. There. Wait. So that's that. The flush is, it just calls flush on the underlying thing, which I guess was buffered in this case. Yeah. So that's, that's everything except the SPI, which is small. Um, if you want to make your own implementation of JSR 353, you start here. You subclass JSON provider and you implement all these methods. And this, this method returns your own JSON provider and that's it, then you have an implementation. Um, there was a big discussion on the mailing list that the lookup of the provider is somewhat expensive. Uh, it involves class scanning, I think. 
uh, which is why these factory methods exist. If you create a parser factory, it can just give you a parser fine every time. If you call this method, uh, the lookup has to happen every time you call it. So, um, I mean, we're all teased as Java developers for making factories for things, but there, there was a real performance concern about not including the factory stuff. Yeah. So uh, REST and JSON go together like peanut butter and jelly. They, they're good on their own, but they're pretty good together. Yep. Have you tried to integrate this with Jersey? That's a good question. I haven't played with the integration. It was just discussed last week, actually. So okay. I'm not sure that it's implemented yet. Do you think they'll roll this in as part of Jersey? They will, yes. Um, that's been decided. Um, so this is the integration. Um, right. You can accept any JSON structure as an argument, and you can return any JSON structure as a return type. Um, there's, there was no discussion about integrating the um, streaming APIs with Jersey. Uh, would that be important to you? Because like, I mean, there, are, there is a use case for it, of course, right? So that's worth raising. Um, that discussion's happening in a thread on the um, JAXRS um, project. Okay. So if you go onto the JAXRS project, you can find the thread. It's still fresh. It was just like last week. I, th I think the goal is to move away from the, the JSON.org Thing. Yep. It seems like with a lot of this, they've worked hard to to allow for that. Yeah, you know, it's just a few imports here and there, and the the writers and readers are what we did ourselves. Yes, of to course. Pull those out. Yeah. But I mean, it should be. I don't want to spend a lot of time. On that. Right. So that's that's a good point. Um, of course, of course, a rest. A REST application might be squirting out a couple megabytes of JSON, and, and you yeah. don't want to do that with an object. So um, I would definitely recommend that you raise that as soon as possible, because there's, given that I don't think this has been implemented yet, okay. there's, there's still time to negotiate that the streaming API should also be included in, in the integration. Okay. Um, that's, I think that is an oversight more than anything. So yeah. Right. And the second question is, will this ever uh, make its way to Android, or is that a political issue? Um, yeah, well, uh, of course I'm not a lawyer, but yeah. from my own following of, of the Android Oracle case, um, sounds like the structure, sequence, and organization of an API is not protectable. So I can't see any reason this couldn't be implemented on Android. Right, so there may be an Apache implementation of this, which would just show up. In yeah, Android. exactly. The place where the where the legal nuts start to get tightened is on the TCK license. Okay. So, yeah. uh, like the Harmony project wouldn't have access to the official TCK, okay. uh, because if they did, they'd have to. They would have to live up to requirements that they can't on Android. So, yeah. Yeah. So, unless there's any more questions, yeah. The JSON exception look like. Oh, good question. Let's look at it. Let's just try to produce one. Try to produce one? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's say... Well, by leaving out the... Um, Let's do something nuts. Like, yeah. From by streaming, leaving out the, the start, start array, array, that should do it, right? Yeah. So this one is a JSON generation exception. And it says that we can't write a string because we're not in an array. Whoops, that isn't what I expected. Interesting. Um, here's JSON parsing exception. So that's. If, if an implementation was to provide location information, it would have to do it in the message, because there's no structural location. Yeah, that would I, don't, I don't think I'd want to see it in just in the exception, because there's no. other situations where you want it. And I, I wouldn't want it in the, in the message, because if you need to do something programmatic or translate it or something. Yeah. That's, actually, that's, that's another, I would say, almost dangerous omission, because I know uh, what like in Effective Java, when they talk about ex exception design, that 
if, if the only way of getting at some information is in the message, people are going to parse the message because they need the information. So by not including the location information in a, in a proper way, that's, that's probably a danger zone for this spec. So we should definitely discuss that as well. Great. Uh, you had a question as well? Oh, no, it was about the exception. So there is one other exception on this side. It's just JSON exception. That's the part. I think that's the parent of JSON parsing. So it might be. And that's yes. kind of the generation of parsing. Yeah. So that's, that's JSR 353. Runtime exception, that's a good. Yes. Yes. <laughs> we don't have to be declaring them all over the place. <laughs> yeah. Good. Okay, well, we can uh, start heading over to the other room and, and drink and chat and have fun. <laughs> <laughs>